All right, let me pray for us before we get started, guys. Father, thank you for today. Uh, I thank you for these men that have uh, endured the long sessions of teaching today and, and have hung in there to hear from you, Lord. That's uh, such a testament to, to why they're here, that given all the opportunities they, they could have to disconnect, they choose to instead find a real connection in you. Father, I pray that uh, as I speak, Lord, that I would just be a vessel for you, uh, that this would not be my words but yours. And Father, I pray that uh, just like the rain doesn't fall without bearing fruit, that uh, your word would fall here and bear fruit in people's lives. Uh, be with us in this time. Uh, Lord, use me, guide me, and uh, I pray that uh, you give us uh, soft hearts and ears to hear. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so this breakout we're going to do, we're going to be talking about physical disciplines and the, the importance of physical disciplines in the Christian walk. And surprisingly, while I was preparing to, to speak about this, there has not been a lot of commentary or study uh, in theology circles about the necessity for physical disciplines and, and why physical discipline is important, uh, but it's not because we don't find it in Scripture. So we poured out the chips and the M&Ms for conviction over here, so if you guys came up and grabbed a handful, you know who you are. All right. So again, just because it's not talked about doesn't mean it's not because it's in Scripture. So first off, we'll go to Genesis 1, verse 26 through 31. And it says, Then God said, Let us make man in our own image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female, he created them. And God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and fill the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of the earth, and every tree with seed in its fruit. You shall have them for food. And to every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the heavens, and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so, and God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning the sixth day. So, if God has taken man and fashioned him out of the dust and breathed life into him and created us in his image, then our bodies are not inconsequential. Our bodies have purpose. They have meaning. Again, in Colossians 1, 15 through 16, we see, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. Whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. So, again, if by Christ all things have been created through him and for him, then our physical bodies are created through and for the glory of Christ. Again, not inconsequential. Lastly, 1 Corinthians 1, verse 31. So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all things to the glory of God. So not only do our bodies matter, it matters what we do with them. So this idea, like how often do we think, okay, so the way I eat and the way I drink is, is meant to bring glory to God. Is that something that we commonly do? We'll, we'll sit down at a dinner table, we'll say a blessing, but it, it tends to be more cultural than, than sitting down and being like, like God, I'm really thankful for the provision you've given. Living in this aspect of like praying for our daily bread, it doesn't make sense in this Western culture because we have such abundance. Where in other cultures, if we were to sit down uh, you know, around a bowl of rice, and we were to, to actually just kind of pick at this thing, we'd go, like, man, we're really thankful. Like, it, it, has, it has real meaning. So two-part question, and the first one's obvious. Does how we eat and how we rest and how we exercise matter to our body? Easy answer, right? The things I put in my body, how I rest, how I exercise, it matters to my body. Second part of that question is, does the way I eat and the way I rest and the way I ac exercise matter to God? Absolutely, because if I'm created in his image through him and by him and for him, then it absolutely matters how I eat, how I rest, and how I exercise. So the first thing I want us to look into is how do I glorify God with food and drink? So 1 Corinthians 10, 23 through 33, this passage is talking about doing all things of the glory of God. So he says, all things are lawful, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful, but not all things build up. So let no one seek his own good, but the good of his neighbor. 
Eat whatever is sold in the meat market without raising any question on the ground of conscience, for the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. If one of the unbelievers invites you to dinner and you're disposed to go, eat whatever is set before you without raising any question on the ground of conscience. But if someone says to you this has been offered to a sacrifice, then don't eat it for the sake of the one who informed you and for the sake of conscience. I don't mean, that, I don't mean your conscience but his, for why should my liberty be determined by someone else's conscience? If I partake with thankfulness, why am I denounced because of that for which I give thanks? So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all things to the glory of God. Give no offense to Jews or to Greeks or to the church of God, just as I try to please everyone in everything I do, not seeking my own advantage, but that of many that they may be saved. Like, that's a crazy idea. Have we ever thought about the way I eat and drink and partake is for the salvation of others? Again, it's not something common. So, focusing on verse 24, verse 24 says, Seek the good of your neighbor. All right, Romans 14, verses 1 and 3, it, Paul kind of outlines this. He says, As for the one who is weak in faith, welcome him, but not to quarrel over opinions. One person believes he may eat anything, while the weak person eats only vegetables. Let not the one who eats despise the one who abstains, and let not the one who abstains pass judgment on the one who eats. For God is welcoming. So he's saying don't quarrel about food. All right? if, you, if you like to partake in meat, and you have a neighbor who doesn't, it says, hey, like, don't despise him. He's just weak in faith, right? Like, it sounds like a joke, but it's in Scripture. If you're a vegetarian, you're weak. I'm sorry. It's in the Bible. But on the same time, right, it, if, you, if you don't, like, if you don't eat meat because you don't feel it's glorifying to God and you choose to eat vegetables, fine, but don't despise your brother because he chooses to eat meat. What the point is in all of this is he says, don't create a stumbling block of salvation for somebody that could be saved, but also don't divide the body of Christ over something like food. We're free to all, but, but the Lord has given different, different convictions. So be mindful of that and allow that. Verse 27 through 28, though, this is, this is the one that I find more convicting and more in our context, right? It says, if one of the unbelievers invites you to dinner and you're disposed to go, eat whatever is set before you without raising any questions on the ground of conscience. But if someone says to you, this has been offered in a sacrifice, then don't eat it for the sake of the one who has informed you and for the sake of conscience. So he's talking about don't partake of this meat that's been offered as a sacrifice. So he's saying, yeah, it's all lawful. Like, it's fine. It's all good for you. But if it's been given... As a sacrifice, don't partake of it. So why would that be said? Well, so me, me and my wife, the Lord is, uh, has given us the ministry to West Africa. We're getting prepared to go and, and give our lives in Togo. Blake, the guy who's given a hard time coming down here, him and his wife also uh, are in process of going to West Africa. So we'll be a team when we get there. And, and, and I'm bringing that up to point out, like, this idea, we tend to, to look at this and go, yeah, yeah, don't eat meat, sacrifice, you know, that, that's a sacrifice to, to an idol or a demonic god doesn't really apply. But in the church in West Africa, it very much applies because this is an animistic society where they still worship idols and they openly worship demons. So animal sacrifice is a common thing. So if they were to break bread and, and have communion with unbelievers in their society, then there's a good chance that as they partake in this dinner that there's going to be meat that's been sacrificed to an idol and it's going to be offered to them. Now, is it lawful for them to eat that meat? Yes. But the scripture says, hey, don't partake in that. Because cause this is about glorifying God. So if they were to eat this meat, then somebody from the outside who is a non-believer could see, oh, those guys say they're Christians, but I see them eating this meat that was sacrificed to this idol or to this demon. So maybe Jesus is just another one of the gods and many gods, and, and they're just worshiping both. So it, it doesn't really matter whether I follow him. So he's saying the, the way you partake in this eating, the way you partake in this meal is a direct reflection that's going to glorify Christ. So by abstaining from this, you're going to set yourself apart. You're going to be a holy people. And then people are going to understand why it is that you don't partake in that. But maybe better yet to put it in, in our American context, maybe not in the, in the way we eat that would be given to sacrifices, but what about the way we, way we drink? Like, is it lawful for me to have a beer? Yeah. Yeah, if I want to have a drink, I can have a drink. But if the people I've surrounded myself with are, are unbelievers, 
and they're consuming in a way that is unrighteous and unglorifying, and I partake in that, I'm not setting myself apart. Likewise, if anybody from the outside was to witness me with these people partaking of, of this alcohol unrighteously, and, and whether I have or not, but they see me standing there with, with a beer in my hand, they're going to lump me into the hole, just like anyone else. So I have to be careful about, about what I do and how I do it in a way that most glorifies God. So similar to the way I drink, the proportions that I eat can either glorify God or distract from his glory. And this is where we start to squirm a little bit because we like our meat and we like our barbecue and we like to eat a lot of it and we feel free for it. But likewise, the way we eat is going to have a direct reflection. And the way, I, the way I think about this, right, I know that mentally and spiritually, whatever I'm thinking drives my emotions, right? Emotions aren't intelligent. If you have emotions and there's no thought behind it, all right, that, that's a disorder. You should get that checked out. Go talk to somebody. But our thoughts typically drive our emotions. And then our emotions become actions, and those actions become habits. So... I don't need to change the habit of how I eat. I have to change the way I think about food. Most people who overindulge and they eat too much, right, they're using this as a coping mechanism to mask fear or frustration or anxiety. This isn't about the food. It's about a deeper heart issue. So why do most diets don't work? It's because diets only address the symptoms of the problem. Weight gain is only a symptom of a heart issue. Diets don't work because they address the symptoms. You have to get to the deeper heart issue that's driving this indulgence. So when I think about the way I eat, I need to take a step back, and I need to start reshaping the way I look at food and why it is that I feel a draw towards that. 2 Corinthians 10, uh, verses 3 through 6. It says, for though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ, being ready to punish every disobedience when your obedience is complete. So, so if I change the way I think about food, Right? What it's saying is that I'm taking every thought captive. So, so seek to understand what is, what is driving that indulgence. So whenever I feel tempted, right, if I was to, if I was to say, yeah, like I, I'm free to, free to indulge in a can of Copenhagen every now and then. Okay, fine. But, but if I notice that every time I put a dip in, it's because I'm feeling anxious or I'm feeling frustrated or I'm feeling overwhelmed, like, that's not glorifying to God. That's sinful because what I'm doing is I'm taking a substance and I'm replacing what I should be submitting to Christ with something that's going to mask that so I don't have to submit it to him. It's the same thing with food, all right? If I get frustrated or anxious or I'm just not feeling like, man, I'm just going to go get, I'm going to go get a blizzard or something. I'm just going to consume and I'm going to consume because this makes me feel good temporarily and, and it masks what is a deeper issue. What I'm saying is I'm finding this food more satisfying than submitting it to Christ and, and really speaking truth into this situation. So, so how I consume, how I pursue matters. So, so food is good, right? The Lord said it was pleasing. It's good. It's nourishing into the body. But good things become bad things when they become ruling things. Whenever that food starts to take dominion over things that I should be submitting to Christ, then it's no longer good. It's sinful. Next, how do we glorify God with rest? And this is something that I struggle with, right? Naturally, as as a worker and a fixer, like I just want to do. Given the opportunity, if it's 1 o'clock in the morning and I'm running behind on having a sermon prepared and I have an opportunity to dive into that for another hour or two or get some sleep, I'm probably going to lean in to staying up for another hour or two and working on that than getting the rest the Lord says I need and and trusting the rest to him. So how we rest also matters. Have you ever noticed how sleep affects us physically, mentally, spiritually? Right? I got four kids and my youngest one is three weeks old. Sleep matters. I'm feeling it. I'm feeling it hard. But if I don't get the proper sleep, right, physically I become ill. Mentally, I become foggy. I become cloudy. I don't have good decision-making skills. 
spiritually I can become discouraged. So we have to understand, why is it that a sovereign God would ordain that you're going to spend a third of your life unconscious? Like, if it was about me doing and working and constantly being, then wouldn't he want me to be up 24 hours a day? We, uh, while we were in Africa last time, we had an opportunity to meet again with, uh, you know, these, these animistic uh, believers that, that worship creation and they openly worship demons. And uh, we met with some of the fishermen, and it was Tuesday, and they weren't going out. And they usually go out like, you know, tide comes in, ships rise in the port, tide's going out, they come out, right? They time it, they're gone. Well, they're, they're not. So we're like, Tuesday, why aren't you guys going fishing? They're like, oh, man, well, the demons rest on Tuesday, so they can't protect us. So we don't go out fishing on Tuesdays because our demons can't protect us. Psalm 121, 1 through 4 says, I lift up my eyes to the hills. From where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. Praise the Lord. We serve a God who never sleeps or slumbers. So the the whole purpose of our sleep is to direct us towards his sovereignty. To highlight the limitations of our flesh and saying, yeah, guess what? You can't do it. So a third of your life, you're going to be unconscious. So you're going to learn to rest in that. So for some of us workaholics and, one of, and these guys who are like naturally flick, fixers, the most glorifying we can do is to stop striving. Stop working yourself into the ground to the point where you're, you're not resting in the Lord. Because ultimately what we're doing is we're trying to take Christ off the throne and take control of the things that he's sovereign over and saying, I think I can do this better. Now for others of us, the most glorifying we can, thing we can do is to stop slacking. Because as much as the body says that sleep is necessary and it's nourishing, it has some stern warnings against idolatry, or not idolatry, but idleness as well. 1 Thessalonians 4, 9 through 12, Paul says, Now concerning brotherly love, you have no need for anyone to write to you, for you yourselves have been taught by God to love one another. For that indeed is what you're doing to all the brothers throughout Macedonia. But we urge you, brothers, to do this more and more and aspire to live quietly and to mind your own affairs and to work with your hands as we instructed you so that you may walk properly before outsiders and be dependent on no one. So Paul is telling the church at Thessalonica, he's saying, you guys are brotherly love, man, you got it down. You're doing good. If someone loses a job and you want to help get them back on, your, on their feet, that's a good thing. But whenever we start seeing people inside the church take advantage of its benevolence, we have to shift from the gears from love to discipline. It's one thing to love people well. It's another thing to allow them to walk in disobedience. Like the the work of Christ is about taking up a cross, right? We take up our our cross and we put our hands to the plow. We we are never going to be effective in becoming or making disciples by allowing the church to privately fund disobedience. If we're throwing money at everybody who refuses to put their hands to the plow, like we're, we're not helping them, we're not helping the body, we're not helping them grow in sanctification. And that's a fine line to walk. And that's why we have elders, that's why we have deacons, right? We have to understand how do we walk people through situations in love, understand when we have real legitimate needs that need to be met, and other times we've got to take our hands off and go, you know what, we, we can't support this anymore. You're going to have to grow. You're going to have to work. You're going to have to get up and do this for yourself because God has created us to to provide and protect, right? He put him in the garden, told him to keep it, work it, all right? Next, how do we glorify God in exercise? One, One thing that the military, I think, has learned faster than church, unfortunately, is that pushing our body to do things that it doesn't want to do is more of a a mental and heart issue than it is a bodily thing. Pushing your body to do things that it doesn't naturally want to do provides mental and spiritual resiliency that would be hard to find otherwise. And we get that. I, I, I know that, you know, during, during my time in the service, uh, as we set up scenarios and we train guys for war, like there's situations where, that we design because we want people to be encouraged and built up. And there's other situations where we're going we're gonna to stress them and we're going to have them be brought low because we need to teach them how to reframe things. So when we, when we train CQB, like the close quarter stuff, room clearing, all right, 
Like, that, that's a moment where we're not trying to foster discouragement. I'm not setting up unrealistic scenarios where everybody dies and nobody wins because the last thing I want is somebody to go into a fatal funnel and then remember their training and go, yep, this is where I die every single time. No, I want them to go through that door expecting to win. So I'm going to set up scenarios where they're going to have success. I'm going to equip them to do so. We're going to gradually escalate things and, and present new scenarios so they get these mental reputi- repetitions, and now as they become more proficient in the basics, it just starts to happen. But in the squad leaders course, there are situations that we would design that were meant where you're not going to win. It doesn't matter what you do, you're not going to win. But there was a purpose in that. It wasn't about defeating or beating somebody down. It was about creating opportunities where we could see as leaders, how do they reframe disappointment? How do they reframe defeat? I want to give them an opportunity to teach them how to to reframe, regroup, and then disciple others to do the same. How do they take difficult situations and reshape that? And that's something that physical stress on our bodies can produce as we exercise, as we're in the gym and we're trying to get that last rep, right? This is an opportunity where our body is failing and physical stress is being had and we have, we're feeling these emotions and mentally we're wanting to quit, but we have an opportunity to speak a different kind of truth into it and say, yeah, I, I can. I'm going to reshape this. I'm going to look at this as another opportunity, opportunity to grow. Like, that's a physical discipline thing. Like, but can you imagine, like, do you see the spiritual application to this? Could you imagine a church that whenever it met challenges and hardships, learned to reframe that into opportunities? Man, like, these Bible study groups aren't going the same way. Like, they're, they're not going good. We're not seeing the effects. We're not seeing people come to Christ. You say, good, good. This is an opportunity for us to regroup, to reevaluate how we're doing this, maybe to seek outside counsel. Like maybe we need to shift gears. We need to refocus. Maybe the, maybe the Lord in his sovereignty is growing us. Maybe he's given us a season where we're not seeing a lot of fruit, so we learn to lean more and rely more on him. Like if the Lord is truly sovereign in all these things, then, then we need to trust that. But we also have an opportunity through physical exercise to build this mental muscle memory, right? Where as I physically push through strenuous things and I do things that I don't want to do and I'm constantly reshaping going, yeah, last time I hit this breaking point, I folded, but this time I'm not. And then I I get that victory, I get that win, and I start to learn to eat this elephant one piece at a time where I go, yeah, I got this far, now this next time I'm going to do this, and next time I'm going to do this and this. And then when it comes to spiritual disciplines, we meet those same walls where we butt up and we go, man, like I haven't been disciplined in my Bible study. I haven't been disciplined in the word. I haven't been disciplined in prayer. All right, that's an opportunity. Next week I'm going to hit this. Tomorrow I'm going to hit this. We're going to grow. We're going to advance. So by, by being active, right, by, by exercising, by doing these things in our body, we're creating mental reps that will reshape the way we do spiritual application as well. I want to make one point in that, though, like, just, just as serious as it is to neglect the body, a lot of people in our culture go the opposite direction as well. There are those that see exercise as a way to be self-gratifying. They see exercise as a way to build themselves up and to create an image that's about being self-exalting and Christ, instead of being Christ-exalting, and that's not healthy either. That's just as simple. So it's not about just exercising. It's about the reason we do it. Like, do, do I discipline my body in a, in a way that's meant to glorify God in everything that I do so that, that those who look at me from the outside don't find anything lacking? Romans six twelve through 13, it says, Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passion. Do not present your members of sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life, and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. That word instruments, like, it's not talking about, uh, you know, a whisk when you're baking cookies. It's instrument, like, in this context means a weapon. Like, your body, the members of your body are weapons for Christ. 
So do we think of our body as weapons for God? Right? And Nick talked about this this morning. Like Our salvation isn't about inviting Christ to come sit in the tax booth with us. There's, there's a spiritual, mental, and physical going that's required. And our bodies have to be prepared for that going, prepared for that action. So how do we glorify God in our bodies? One, we need to be equipped to be active in the home. I got a lot of kids, and I don't care how young you are, you are never going to have enough energy to keep up with those kids. You can work hard, but it's difficult. But it's absolutely necessary that, that our bodies are in a condition where we can invest in that. Because the reality is, is that our children are typically going to look at their heavenly father through the lens of their earthly father. So the way we live our lives and the way we engage in our children is going to have an effect later on in life on, on how they view God and his sovereignty and, and his love for them. Because I, I hear this so often, like, students have a really hard time believing that the father they can't see loves them if the father they do see doesn't display it. When I'm tired at the end of the day and I want to go home, like my kids aren't, are never going to remember me sitting down on the couch and watching TV with them. That's not memorable. But if I take the time to wrestle with my boys, they're going to remember that. My boys are going to remember the time I, I went out in the yard to throw a baseball, to throw a football, to take them mountain biking, to teach them new skills. Like my, my son, like I used, <laughs> I, I used splitting wood to punish him. And he started to love it. So I had to find a new punishment. But still, like, he valued that. Like, I, I took him out and taught him how to split wood. And he was like, man, that was good. We got it before dark, and I split wood for, like, eight hours. But it was good. He enjoyed that. Like, my body has to be disciplined enough where I can really invest in my children because my first ministry is the home. Next, I, I got to be equipped to be active in the world. As men, our bodies are created not to serve ourselves, but to serve others. Here's what's, here's what's radical about Christianity, right? Unlike any other religion, our God doesn't choose to dwell in temples made by man. He makes man itself a temple, and he indwells us with the Holy Spirit. So the God of creation puts his spirit inside of us, and he chooses to demonstrate his love for the world through the people that he created in his image. Like, that's what our bodies are created for. We have to be active in our communities. We have to be active and engaged in the world. You know, I think about the guys that are, that are here this weekend, like Vic and Nick. Like, these guys are trained at an elite level. And they've trained and disciplined their bodies in a way where they can be a light in a dark place. Like, this is about freeing the oppressed. This is about delivering the weak. But we can't relinquish that to men in elite positions to do. Like, we have to look for opportunities in our daily lives to use our body to the service of others. Like, if I have an opportunity in my community to bind up the brokenhearted and to serve them with my body, but when that, when that time and that opportunity comes, I find that my body's in such poor condition that I can't answer the call, that should break my heart. If there are widowed and orphaned that have needs that only a man can fulfill, whether that's, again, splitting wood for the winter or fixing or repairing or whatever physical service you can provide and you find your body isn't equipped to do that, that should burden you. Because you had an opportunity to be the light in a dark place and share the gospel, and you haven't been disciplined enough in your body to see that, see that opportunity through. Like, we should feel that weight. Have any of you guys uh, heard of the, the 1040 window? Some of you? Okay, so the 1040 window, this is, uh, this is the area of the world, you know, kind of starting in, in Africa through Asia that falls between 10 degrees latitude and 40 degrees latitude. And 90% and of, the, of the unreached, unengaged people in the world live in that 1040 window. So we're talking of the 55 least evangelized countries, 97% of our population lives in that window. 4.4 billion people without Christ. 
But here's the, here's the hope in that, right? The harvest is white. Don't focus on that the workers are few. Focus on the harvest is white. If your body is healthy enough to travel across the Atlantic, walk a mile or two a day, and carry a blue passport, you can engage the globe with the power of the gospel. That's it. Like, don't believe this myth that you've got to have some kind of special training and you've got to have this connection and you've got to do this and you've got to do that. If the Holy Spirit dwells inside of you and you have the gospel, the word of God, God uses ordinary men and women to proclaim his gospel in unreached places. Like, there is nothing significantly special about me and my wife or Blake and Kristen or any of us. God has just chosen to take ordinary people and put a call on their life to go and do something. Be a part of the unreached. You have that same opportunity. If we will have enough physical discipline to just do moderately athletic stuff that where our body isn't so broken that we can't travel and we can't engage, you can reach the nations. Lastly, we should be equipped to bear witness. So there's this picture that I should be physically disciplined to protect my witness. 1 Corinthians 9, 24 and 27 says, Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one receives the prize? So run that you might obtain it. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we are imperishable. So I do not run aimlessly, I do not box as one beating the air, but I discipline my body and keep it under control, lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. This word disqualified literally translates into being found counterfeit. So we, we don't want to be found disqualified. We don't want to be found counterfeit. Because the reality is, is if the gospel that I preach is that Christ is fully satisfying and fully worthy, but the fruit of my life bears witness that Christ can't fully satisfy my appetite or he's not fully worthy of me disciplining my body, then I'm walking in a counterfeit gospel. Because what I'm preaching doesn't line up with the way I'm living. So my challenge for us as we leave here is to to go and explore the hard issues. To go and look for opportunities in our lives where we're tempted to overindulge in food or we're tempted not to to be active with our children, we're not to be active in our communities or we just have these, these periods of times where we feel kind of slothful and lazy and we're really not wanting to be up and involved and to say, what is the root of that issue? Take that thought captive, examine it. Say, why do I feel this way? What circumstances are happening around my life right now that are driving this? And then once I see it for what it is, I'm going to use the knowledge of God to speak truth into that situation, to rely on the promises of God, and then I'm going to walk in obedience. So I encourage you as as we walk away here today, look for those opportunities, speak truth into those situations, and then walk in obedience. Okay? All right, let me pray for us. Father, I'm thankful for the people you've put in this room. I'm thankful for the men that that you've brought here to hear your word. Lord, my prayer is that we would rely completely on you. Father, we would trust in the promises of God more than our own efforts. Father, we would look for every opportunity to glorify you, whether it's in the way we eat or the way we sleep or the way we exercise. Lord, that I would rest in your sovereignty, that I would not try to earn salvation or I would not try to outwork you, but I would allow you to sit on the throne and be sovereign. And, Lord, that I would discipline my body so that it wouldn't hinder my witness. That in whatever I do, Lord, I'd be seeking to glorify you. I'm thankful for these men. I pray you continue to work in our hearts through this weekend. Be with Brody as he prepares tonight. Be with Spencer as he gets ready to teach on the importance of the local church. Father, I pray that you continue to open our eyes and our hearts to your word. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen.